this is going to be the last week of Who Am I? So let's jump into it. And this is probably the most applicable topic that I've saved for last for some reason and did on Daylight Savings Day. Hindsight, I would have probably done it different, but it's Who Am I with my family? Who am I with my family? We're going to talk about parenting today. We're going to talk about marriage today. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about the teenage years today. It's going to be so, so much fun. <laughs> you excited like I am for it? Oh, my gosh. Often we feel ill-equipped to deal with the challenges that families face, and that's just the truth. We're, and we're going to look at the very first chapter of the Bible to kind of get a framework, to kind of get a foundation of, of how we're going to answer this question. And here's the key. How you define family, this is good for in your notes. You could write this down, remember it for later. How you define family shapes the identity of every person in the family. I'll say it again. How you define family shapes the identity of every person in the family. It's not just you, but how you define family as a mother, as a father, will also identify and define the people in your family because it rubs off on them. And we don't choose our family. Can I get an amen on that? Like, we're just born into them. Somebody, you're like, I don't want to say amen. But uh, hey, it is what it is. We're born into a family and we just got to de- kind of deal with it that way. But we do have choices. Every single one of us, no matter how you were born into this family, no matter how your family was growing up, every single one of us has choices to make on whether or not we are going to lean into God's way or do it our own way. And that, that affects our identity and the identity of the family. Many of us, because of how we were raised, we don't even know the basic foundational principles of how to be a part of a family. Like, I, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands because your family's probably here with you. And don't insult them like that. But because of how we were raised, we just don't have any concept. We don't know the, principle, the principles that it takes to be a part of a good, functioning, godly family. A, a foundation is an important part of every building process. Unless you got kids, my, my kids age, and they play Minecraft. In Minecraft, you don't have to worry about foundations at all. Here's a picture of something that my kids would build um, in Minecraft. They wouldn't build anything just like that. But if you can see right here underneath, there ain't nothing holding that house up. There ain't nothing holding that house up. All right? The laws of physics don't apply in Minecraft at all, one bit. So I, you know, I'm just inundated with Minecraft music. In fact, I hear Minecraft music in my sleep. That's why I sleep so well. Only parents of young kids will understand. <laughs> good sleeping music, good sleeping music. Um, if, if my kids did build a house like this, I'll tell you what would be different about it. It would be covered in cats. Yeah. Cats. They love the cats. They figured out how to spawn. That's how you talk about like make stuff. You spawn cats and then you feed them apples or tuna or fish or whatever over and over again. And then little hearts bubble up over their heads and they, and they follow you everywhere. Meow, meow. No. And they've got like, the two of them are both playing, uh, my son and my daughter are both playing together and they got like 13 cats each. And all 26 of them are meowing. Meow, 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 meow. And all of that peaceful music is drowned out by the sound of cats. I mean, how much worse could it be? It's like, you're teasing me, teasing me with this peaceful whatever. And it's like, that's not natural, first of all, because cats don't follow me anywhere. Cats run away from me. Only when I want to pet them, they run away from me. And only when I don't want them around me is when they follow me around. Can I get an amen? amen. Don't get me started about cats right now. I'm very, I've, my heart is very tender towards cats right now. We lost a cat and then gained a new cat on the last couple months. So I'm like, I don't know if I'm happy or sad about cats. But let me show you a different picture about this Minecraft uh, uh, one. This is more like, this is, this is what I'm trying to tell you. No foundation at all. There is nothing, nothing that works about this picture right here. This is not natural, but this is how my kids think. Oh, that's how you build houses. And when I've got to fix things in the house, and when I've got to do something outside or like want to do like a picnic setup out in my backyard, they're like, Dad, just make it, just make it float. Just make it float on the grass because they've have, they've have no concept of what a foundation means to building a house. And let me get to the point here. Some of us, we, we, we take an image like this and the, the, the laws of this, the natural laws of having a foundation to hold something up don't apply to when we're building a family because we don't have the foundation. We don't have a foundation underneath what we're trying to build on. My kids don't even know how to say foundation. It was, they, they got all the teeth are missing right now, the stage of life that they're in. Oh my gosh, you guys, the stories could just never end. I could make fun of them all day up here. It would be so much fun for me, but I'm not going to because I love them. I love them very much, as you can tell. I love them. 
I want to squeeze them tight. I love them. <laughs> They're six and seven. It's like a, it's a beautiful age. This is how the world is teaching grown-ups how to build a family. No foundation required. Just, just put blocks wherever you want. Just like you just do whatever you want. You kind of feel it out. But this is not how families were intended to operate because spiritual laws do apply when it comes to building a family the right way, in a way that's gonna stand the test of time, in a way that's gonna provide you with what you really want in your own family. You can't just go willy-nilly into this thing. Now, God can redeem. God can help you out if you, if you haven't started out the right way. But let me just tell you, if you're here now listening to my voice about family, you need to lean in on this. You need to lean in on this. Get to the edge of your seat and start taking those notes because this is, this is critical. This is critical to your, your children, your future children, your, your spouse, your future spouse. This matters so much. And this, this topic shapes our society and our culture more than politics ever will, more than, more than anything. Because how we raise our children, how we, how we steward our marriage relationship, what we do in those situations shapes our world more than you know, more than you know. So what is the foundation of a family? Um, even as we begin the conversation, I know that there might be pain there because your family, your family life wasn't great growing up. And now you are only bringing in certain practices, certain principles, and even like me having to wrestle with addictions of the past and you're trying to get those things out of the way. You're trying to figure your own self out while you're trying to raise kids or while you're trying to have a marriage, you're trying to figure your own self out. That makes things really, really complicated. I, I know that, if you're anything like me, and I feel like a pretty average person, I think I'm a pretty normal person, you might feel inadequate at times. You might feel like, I just don't know. I don't feel equipped. Every time something tough comes up, I struggle with it. I gotta tell you, I understand that. I understand that feeling, but I wanna tell you that there is hope in God's word today, and I'm gonna give that to you. I'm gonna bring you God's hope of how to build a, a wonderful Christ-honoring family that's gonna bless you in good times and especially when times are tough. Man, it's gonna be so good. So before we get to Genesis 1, because this is where God really paints the picture, we need to talk about Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is really powerful and probably the best book to deal with the concept of identity in Christ. And we've saved it for the last, so we haven't talked about it much to this point. But the book of Ephesians is so powerful in this. It talks about being in Christ and Ephesians connects being in Christ with being in a family. This book is wonderful for families because it talks to kids, it talks to husbands, it talks to wives, it talks to parents, and it speaks to the home so very much. And there's a key verse right here. I wanna give it to you right now. Ephesians 3, starting in verse 14. Ephesians 3, 14 says this. For this reason, Paul says, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I'm gonna say that again because everything we need is like packed into this really short verse. I usually like to read like a, a big chunk, but, but this is, it's all right here. I'm gonna read it again. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. And let me just remind you of something you already know. Name provides identity. Your name provides your identity. A name, when Adam was naming all the creatures, he was giving them identity. And he was talking about that. And then when he named Eve, woman, whoa, man. Like there's identity there because they are like one. Because the men and women are like one. They are of the bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. So the name means identity. And every family on heaven and earth derives its name from heaven, from God. What does this mean? It means in heaven, God has named and established the identity of every family. And that is great news because that means there is a book on parenting. As much as the world says, oh, there's no book on parenting. Eh, yes, there is. It's right there in your hands if you got it. It's the, it's the Bible. There is a book on parenting, on marriage, on good relationships of every kind. There is a book on that. One book. One book. Any other book? hopefully is getting its principles from the book. That's what I'm trying to say. God created the pattern, the foundation 
the blueprint. Are you seeing what I'm saying? There is a foundation on which to build. And the picture in his mind of what a family is supposed to look like is found in his word. The pattern speaks to identity and purpose. You're created in his image and so is your family. Your family is created in his image as well. Just like you're created in his image, you are a masterpiece, his masterpiece, his, his handiwork, so is your family. And it's your responsibility, church, I wanna let you know it's your responsibility. You get the choice. You get the chance to walk in it or not, or not. And I would, I would just guess about you, if, if not, it's out of ignorance. It's out because you just didn't know. That was me. I didn't know either, all right? I got saved later on after my first son was already born. I'm gonna get into that in, in just a minute, but family and the desire for family makes us ask the who am I question more than any other thing in existence, doesn't it? It brings out the best and worst in us. <laughs> family, come on, somebody. I mean, you're all, you're all acting really tame today, but you know I'm telling the truth. Family, what else other than family is going to make you dig deep to do the right thing or cause you to do the wrong thing? I don't know. I mean, but let me just, let me put it in perspective. If you're single and you want a family and it's taking longer than expected, God, who am I in my singleness? I mean, wanting a family and the desire for family can cause us to want to, like, it can impact our identity. I don't know who I am without a wife, without a girlfriend, without a boyfriend. Huh? Maybe you know somebody like that. Maybe it's not you, but maybe you know someone like that and you lack the words to articulate, man, you don't need that to identify, but it makes us ask the question, who am I when I'm on my own? So single people, check this out. And also when you get married and you find out, wow, this is a lot harder than I thought, <laughs> like a lot harder than I thought, and uh, this other person who I thought would complete me is not answering this who am I question for me. God, who am I when I'm one with another? Who am I when I'm supposed to be one with them, but I don't even know who I am and they're not answering the question for me? Who am I? And then maybe the marriage doesn't work. Many people have found themselves here. Many people. Don't feel bad if it's you, but am I defined by this now? Is my identity now a divorced person Someone who had a marriage and it didn't work out, is that my identity now? God, is that, is that who I am? Am I marked for life? What if you've been widowed? If you're a single mom, a single dad, how do people see me? What's my identity in this context? What about with these kids? Because right around the time you start figuring out your own identity, these little things pop out and they test you to every single limit that you have. And now you got to deal with them and they're expensive and they're messy and every single one of them is different. And what works with one offends the other. God, please help us. God, please help me. <laughs> and then we asking, we're asking our own identity questions when we're supposed to be shaping the identity of these little people. And that's why we have to look up for our answers. We cannot look around for the identity answer. We can't look around. We have to look up. And even the most tempting place to want to find identity outside of God is either in a spouse or your kids. And I'm telling you, that's not the foundation. Your foundation is in Christ. Let's acknowledge an obvious truth. It's, it's not easy and you can't feel your way through this. We need concrete answers. We need some tried and true, solid things that we can, on which to build. I mean, you can decorate your family. You can decorate your house. You know, I think about it that way. You could decorate your house. Your family's your family and every family's a little different. You got your own little traditions. You got your own little things you do, but you can't build a family based on, well, this is how I wanna do things. That, I'm talking about the sure, solid rock foundation on when the storms come, my family is not gonna fall. When the storms of life hit, I don't want my family to crumble. So you can have your own personality in your family. You can have your own ways and stuff in your marriage. It's all good. But we have got to build our family on the foundation, the solid rock that is Jesus found in God's word. I'm, like I, I, when I was writing this, I, I even wrote in my notes, you know, sorry, not sorry. Like, I wish it was easier. I wish it was more like, you know what, y'all just like, let me give you a high five today and you're going to be okay. But I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry because the answers are here and they're available to anyone who would have them, who would want them. So let's dig in here. Genesis 1, the very first chapter of your Bible. Genesis 1, starting in verse 27. 
God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now listen to this. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Fill the earth and subdue it. God was basically saying, I want you to start a family. (laughs) That's how I want you to fill this earth, is I want you to have a family. I want you to build your family. I want you to multiply. I want you to grow. I want you to, God told him to start a family. And the cool thing about approaching a family God's way is he blesses what he designs. What God designs, he also blesses. And when we build our lives on, on the, the lives of our family members, and instead of God's truth, there's, when we build our lives on God's truth, there's supernatural blessing there. When we choose the word of God, when we choose to lean into that and build our family on that, there's blessing there that you can't get from the world. There's blessing there, supernatural blessing, that comes when we just choose to do it God's way. And that's really powerful. So for a little bit of notes I got for you, I want you to fill in these blanks. If you've got your bulletins with you, it's right here. Is nothing shapes your identity like family. Hold on a second. I thought you said, I thought you said God shapes my identity. I'm getting to that. Nothing shapes identity like family. That's why we must apply God's pattern. We must apply God's pattern. When when I'm at odds with my spouse, which is never, by the way. Why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? <laughs> Am I that see-through? Who do you think who do you think uh, starts the most fights in, in our house? Me? I'm not even going to ask the second question. Nobody raised their hand, so I'm just saying. They must have, no, it's definitely me. No, it's definitely me. I'm, I'm, the ir- I'm the irritable one. It's me. So when I'm at odds with my spouse, when my kids are nutso, when I'm, I'm the one struggling with this, and when, when maybe, maybe you're still living at home and your parents are nutso, let's, let's flip the script a little bit. Maybe it's your parents, man. They are off base, okay? Maybe they're crazy. How does this practically work? It's not a step-by-step quick fix, this is more of a family philosophy that God, God is giving us as a foundation. And here it is in Deuteronomy 11. Check this out. This is powerful right here. Powerful. It says this, fix these words of mine. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols around your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. He's telling, get you a tattoo on your eyelids, on the inside of your eyelids. I don't know. Like, I don't understand half of this stuff, but I'm just not going to get into it. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. All the time. These words of mine, I want them to be all over the place in your house. I want them spilling out of your mouth and out of your heart at all times. When you're at home, when you're not at home. When you're working, when you're not working. When you're lying down, when you're standing up. When you're out on the, along the road and when you're at home. All the time. This is how. This is how we do it. Now, did you know that that little last bit is really powerful to me um, when it says um, when, you, when they lie down and when they get up? Did you know kids are at their most receptive, their most sensitive, like the five, 10 minutes before bed? Moms are nodding their heads at me right now. Right before bed, that's when they want to open up about their, all their life's problems, right? Right when you're out to put them to bed. Yeah. Amen. <sighs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> right before bed, when it's bedtime, now they want to tell you their life story. They want to tell you everything that's in their heart. But not only when they're laying down for bed, but also when they're getting up in the morning, and when they're just waking up. And that's kind of when I catch them. At nighttime, I am no good. Call me at nighttime and find out how weird I can be. Call me at night, you'll find out. In the morning, I'm all ears. I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. I can pay good attention. And in the morning, sometimes my kids come out to the garage and they, they want to talk to me. And I always stop what I'm doing. I'm, I'm working for hours by the time they wake up. And I turn around in my little swivel chair. And anytime they walk out, I'm just like, come on over here. Yeah, sit on my lap. Tell me what's going on. And they're just, their hair is like, Emma's hair is like doubled over. It's up here. She's got the tallest hair. And she's like squinting going, um, what? She, they're so different. And then Evan comes out and his eyes are bloodshot, but open wide. He's so scary looking. It's so scary looking, really. And he looks like something out of a horror movie. He's like possessed or something. But they just look different when they wake up. But both of them, both of them are very receptive. So I take a few minutes out of whatever I'm doing at that moment because I want to engage with them at that time, at that time. Um, But what this scripture is telling us that 
building your family on God's word is so much more than coming to church. It's so much more than going to the youth group. It's so much more than dropping your kids off in the, in the classroom. It's so much more than that. Praise God for all of those things. You know, we, we do all that and we want those things to happen, but it's something that's supposed to happen all the time, all the time, on your way to practice, uh, in, in, your, in the car when they're like mumbling whatever incoherent nonsense they're mumbling. I'm just, my own life, is, this is very raw for me right now. When they're mumbling back there, don't ignore them. Talk to them, talk to them. When you're taking them to school, picking up from school, when you're at the grocery store and they're in the basket and they're hanging off the side and they're knocking all the mayonnaise jars off, as, as you watch TV, it's as you're talking to them before bed, tucking them in, every moment that presents itself in all times and in every way you can, embed God's truth and God's word into the fabric of your life and into the life of your family. You don't have to be perfect, everybody. I'm not telling you that. Obviously, then that would mean every single one of us doesn't have a chance. You don't have to be perfect to do this. You've just got to lean in a little bit. You just got to lean in a little bit. That's what I'm encouraging you as, as spouses, a hard word for me. As spouses, as parents, as young people in your home. If you're living at home still as a young, I know we got some teenagers up in the room right now. You have a part to play in this too, to be filling your heart up with God's ways, God's word. You should teach them as you learn. That's like the best way to teach, by the way. The, you can only follow a pattern. This is in your notes as well. You can only follow a pattern if you know what it is and the best ways to learn is to teach. So it's like, as you're learning the things that you learned on Sunday, you're talking to your family about. The things that you learn in Sunday school, you're coming home talking to your parents about. The things that you're learning as you're reading your daily devotional, talk to your spouse about it. Just bring it up. You don't have to be all crazy lighting incense and getting, getting on your knees and, you know, doing a Hail Mary and, and speaking in King James, praying. Let's have some prayer time, everybody. You don't have to make, just be yourself. Be yourself, but just bring it out. Bring it out. Hey, I read that we're supposed to be doing this. You ever heard of that? You can be you. You can be you, but engage with God's word with every member of your family. Every member of your family and your extended family. It's especially during, this is, the, this is such a key, especially during non-confrontational times. Parents, spouses, kids, because parents mess up too, so I'm talking to everybody. Why is it that we only want to bring up God's word, we only want to deal with hard issues when there's a confrontation? It's like, and what does that communicate? What does that communicate? I need to fix you. So parents, this is just the most visible this is the most visible illustration I can give, but it happens in every relationship. As soon as they say something they're not supposed to say, as soon as a kid says something they're not supposed to say to their friend, what do you do? You grab them by the collar and go, hey, we don't do that. We don't talk like that. We're Christians. Hey, we don't do that. And it's like we're in correction mode because they did something wrong. And that's the only time we're talking to them about what they should be doing is when they're doing it wrong. What that sends, what message that sends to our kids is you are a problem I need to fix. You are not, you don't know, and I need to fix you. So especially during those non-confrontational times, that's why the Bible said, as you walk along the road, as you're taking them to school, as you're walking, down, like as you're living life, we're supposed to be talking to our families about these things when times are good. Believe it or not, they're, they're going to they're gonna hear and receive you even more, those on the, along the road kind of, kind of things. In the book that we're reading called Who Am I? And it's, I read this in the book, and it was a powerful story, about, um, powerful story about Pastor Jeff, who wrote that book, and who's a friend of ours, and he's such a great guy. Like, he really is. He didn't just write a book on this. He lived a life about this. He is so great with family. Probably one of the best people I've ever met. And he'll say it, too. He's like... My family game, you don't mess with my family game. My family game is on point. And they are, they are all doing good. And he, he like takes pride in it. He's like, I don't mess, you don't mess with my family. You, don't, you can't even come near what I'm doing with my family. And I've, I've seen him with his kids and I go, all right, you got it. Yeah, you got it. He's really good at this, really, really good at this. So when he said it, I really, it resonated with me. It was a story and uh, I'm not sure if he said it in like a, in like maybe we were in a meeting with him or whether it was in the book or not, I can't quite remember. But it was the fact that his dad always called him son. 
So Jeff's dad always called him son. You ever met anybody who did that? You know, like, it's kind of old-fashioned where the dad is like, son, come on, in, come on into the office, son. Son, get into the pickup truck, son. And it's like the son. Son is like, Whoa. and what do you say to a girl? Daughter, come in. That doesn't ring. It doesn't roll off the tongue at all. But he tells the story about how he, his friends would come over, and it was normal to him. But his friends would come over, and they're like, why is your dad always calling you son? But then right around the time he was a late teenager, he started realizing that his dad was teaching him the identity of being a son and that you are not just another person to me, son. You are my son. And every time I interact with you, I'm, t- I'm interacting with you as a father interacts with a son. I'm like, whoa, wow, I never, ever thought of that. That is along the road style teaching. That is just like, he, not when he just messed up, not when he was doing good, but all the time, son, son, and then now he's a pastor and he understands so well and has such a great understanding of what it means to be a son and it makes him an even better father. It's crazy stuff. My mother actually did this with me. Uh, we were raised with Christian values outside of the church. Maybe, maybe you kind of share that. We, we didn't go to church. We never went to church. I think my mom took us to visit a church like twice when we were growing up and it was like, once we went like out of town, somewhere was far. I'm like, where are we going? And then we went there, and it was um, looking back in hindsight, we showed up like an hour early for service. No one was there. My mom didn't even know when the service started, so we just showed up, and then we just gave up on it. Um, but I kind of was, she, it's like she wanted the Christian values without having to go to church because of how she was raised in the church, and it wasn't, it wasn't like it is here. It wasn't, it wasn't great. And so she knew that she believed in God, and she wanted all that. But she wasn't, she wasn't wanting to go to church and anything. But my mom had those values in her heart. And so what my mom would do, my mom did this to me. She would always call out the good things that she saw in me. And let me tell you something, I got in trouble a lot. I was in trouble all the time. I was a problem kid. If I was your kid, you would not have wanted me to be your kid. Let me just tell you right now, I was one of those kids in trouble all the time, always getting notes home from the teachers and just like making her look silly, making her look like a bad mom. She wasn't. And she, but you know what she would do? She would always say things like, you know what? You are so passionate. <laughs> she would say things like that because she was really calling out the good. Th- and I am a passionate person. I grew up knowing that. You are a passionate you're so innovative. Like I would argue with her. I would argue with my mom on anything. And she's like, you're so creative. You would make a good lawyer when you grow up. Have you ever said that to your kids? That's passive aggressive. Let me just tell you. We, uh, we, we know what you're trying to say. Even in jail. Oh, by the way, if you're new here, I've been to jail. <laughs> I forgot. Sorry, I forget my testimony sometimes. Bizarre. I was saved as an adult, drugs and everything. I'm better now. Um, but I did spend some time in jail. And even when I was in jail, I was on a pay phone with my mom, you know, on a collect call with my mom, you know, 1-800-COLLECT, <laughs> 1-800-COLLECT, please say your name after the tone, mom, I'm in jail, please answer. <laughs> and uh, she would answer the phone and she would put money on the commissary and I would call her back and we would, we'd have conversations in there because who else are you going to talk to in there besides your mom, your mother who loves you still? And my mom would say... Um, Elliot, you're such a fireball. <laughs> she said, Elliot, anything you've ever put your mind to, you've, been, you've excelled at. Anything you've ever given your heart to, she said this to me. I'm in jail. I'm in jail like my last tour before going to the Salvation Army. She said, anything you, this is serious, anything you put your heart to, Elliot, you always go above and beyond anyone's expectations. And I believed it. I believed her. So when I gave my heart to Christ, I had a head start. I had a head start because my mom spoke identity into me. My mother shaped my identity. This is how we are supposed to build our families, everyone in our family, speaking life, speaking the words of God. No, you are, you are an overcomer. You are someone who is resilient. You are someone who is creative. She would say things to me like, you, you always make friends wherever you go, Elliot. And I just believed it. 
I just believed it. What if she only came down on me whenever I was messing up? What do you think that would have done to my identity? I don't even know that I'd be a pastor today, honestly. So condemned all the time, always reciting my failures to myself because that's all I've ever heard. Parents, don't condemn yourself too quick. I, I, have to, I struggle with this too because it's so tempting to just correct. It's not just your, I, I, if I said it once, I'll say it a million more times. It's not just your kids. These are the people in your family, your wife, your husband, your teenagers, your parents. You know, believe it or not, kids even can shape identity. Family influences identity. And first up, I want to give some practical tips about marriage. So let's focus in for a second on marriage. Your spouse shapes, not defines your identity. Your spouse shapes, not defines your identity. Marriage, in my mind, is the most important relationship on earth. You might be surprised by that. I stand by that statement. I think marriage is the most important earthly relationship there is. It's the one relationship that Paul wrote in Ephesians says this is how the the body of Christ, the bride of Christ and God the Father are supposed to relate to each other. And, And Jesus is the husband, we are the bride. It's a marriage that he used. And it's the very first relationship on earth that ever existed was a marriage. Adam and Eve, we're a marriage. It didn't start with kids. It started with a marriage. That's why I believe marriage is the foundation. It's the first one. Every family that ever existed started with a marriage. I'm not going to go too deep into that, but I think, you, I think you get it. Whatever. Every family on earth. I'm so inappropriate sometimes. Marriage is the foundation of family. Marriage is the foundation of family. If there's ever something I need to correct more than any other thing is stop putting your kids in front of your marriage. Stop putting, stop prioritizing your kids over your marriage. It's so tempting. They're my flesh. They came from my body. You know, they came from me. Look, they're so innocent, whatever. Oh, right here. And protect them from bad spouse. Oh no, don't do it like this. It happens all the time. It happens even if you know this principle, it can tend to happen. That's the number one thing I remind myself of and I remind others of. Do not prioritize your kids over your marriage. It doesn't help them and it doesn't help you. It doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help anything. The best thing you can do for raising kids is focus on your marriage. Prioritize your marriage because you're showing them what it means to have a family, to start a family. And it starts here between a husband and a wife. And from this healthy place, we raise you. In fact, you wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for this. So get out the way. If the door's closed, don't come knocking, all right? My marriage comes first. Put on door of the Explorer. Go, Diego, go! Oh, my gosh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Where's the water? I need a water. No, I'm kidding. I don't need a water. I mean, let me just tell you something. This is way more than just one message. I should be talking about this for a whole series, and we are planning on doing just that. The series after Easter, so Easter is going to be a blowout, right? We're going to absolutely pack this place out a couple times, and there's going to be a lot of your friends, a lot of your family that you invite and bring, and they're going to come, and they're going to say, you know what? I like it here. They're going to say, you know what? This place, I didn't even imagine church could be like this. I didn't know it could be so life-giving, so applicable. I didn't know it could be so fun. I, didn't, I had no idea it would be so welcoming. They're going to come. They're going to love it. And the very next week, I'm going to bring what I think is going to be the most powerful series for the entire year. If you've been attending regularly, I've been alluding. Since 2022, I've been thinking about this series that's coming up after Easter. It's called All In the Family, like All In Like the only way to get everything out of the family is to go all in. It's not a gamble to go all in with your family. In fact, it's the only way to win. That's kind of the premise. And I'm bringing my best stuff after Easter. That's counterintuitive, by the way. Any any pastor ever will tell you, and that's when you want to go on vacation or something. That's when you want to dial it back. That's not when we're going to dial back. That's when we're going to lean in. That's when we're going to go deep. That's when we're going to bring everything we got to the table because I don't just want your friends and your family to come for some big event like it and then give them leftovers after that. I'm going to bring them my best, my absolute best. We're going to do a whole series on family, 
parenting, marriage. We're doing real life interviews, like cut, video, like these, this promotion is gonna be powerful and we're investing heavily in this series. Mark your calendar right now. Mark your calendar right now. A, uh, April 9th is Easter. April 16th is when we're going for it. April 16th, we're bringing the taco truck. We're bringing the ice cream truck. Come on, if you've been around Lifeline any length of time, you know when it's taco truck time, it's church time, baby. Let's go. Let's do this. I've gone on too long about this, but I, I'm, I'm really serious about it. I'm really serious. Since, since fall of 22, I've been thinking about this series coming up after Easter. Mark your calendars. Bring your friends and family for Easter itself, and I'll tell them all about it. I'll tell them all about it. Um, there's a fallacy out there about marriage. Let's get back to marriage. Um, that there's a person out there who's going to complete you. Let me tell you something. They're not going to complete you. They may be different than you, but they're not going to complete you. And um, who married someone different than them? Anybody? Anybody in the house? Yeah. Anybody who's ever been married, married someone different than them. What is opposites attract? And now I'm going to spend the rest of my life arguing about what to do with our time off. <laughs> Tiffany wants to go to the beach. I want to stay home and play video games, man. Come on. Some guy in here understands what I'm talking about. I just want to stay home. I work hard. I want to relax. And Tiffany wants to relax on the beach, catching a tan, and now we're going to spend the rest of our lives dealing with that tension. And even though we marry people different than us, and that's a beautiful thing, it causes us to confront our identity, that person is not going to complete you. Um, that person is not going to complete you. Um, and because they're so different than you, your spouse influences your character as well. And, and it's awesome, that it adds so much that you wouldn't have before, but she can never complete you. He can never complete you. You can only find your completeness in Christ. So attempt to be less, I'm, I try to find a better way to say this, but less naggy and fault finding. I'm talking to men and women. Less naggy and fault finding. Because that's what we do in marriage. We, we, we fault find and we try, to, we try to build our spouse in our image. We try to build our spouse in the way I think you should be instead of speaking life and encouraging them in how God views them. Let me tell you something about, about love languages. Um, there's a book called The Five Love Languages. Everyone in the whole world has heard about this book. I get it. But let me tell you, all men have the same, one same love language from their wives, words of affirmation. Every man, I don't care what your real love language is. When it comes to your wife, your love language is words. And when your wife speaks life to you, you can do anything, anything. When... When my wife tells me I did a good job, I don't care what anybody says. I know I can do anything. And women also have a, a universal love language, and it's to be, and it's, it's a little bit more broad, because <laughs> women, you know, <laughs> it's more complicated. You're, you have more depth. It's to be treated lovingly as opposed to harshly. It's to be treated lovingly instead of the correction Instead of the do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, it's I need this. No, you need to treat your wife lovingly. Treat your wife with the kind of passion and tenderness. And she needs, instead of telling her what she's doing wrong and what you need her to do, men, tell her what she's doing right. Tell her, tell her that she is all the things that God says about her. You are loved. And you could shape her identity into the identity of Christ rather than, an identity that you have in your mind, what you watched in some movie once of what you think she should do. Let's be honest. Like, that's where that stuff comes from because we watch TV, movies and stuff, and so we, we put that on. So husbands, wives, you have the primary responsibility. Parents, let me talk to you for a second. Parents, parents' responsibility is to help their children discover their identity in Christ. A stable home, which comes from a stable marriage, provides security like nothing else ever will. So when we're working on us, we're helping them. Nobody's perfect, but a little bit goes a long way, parents. A little bit of growth, a little bit of intentionality. Every little improvement helps. And let me just be honest with you. I know I need to grow here. So if you feel like you need to grow here, let me tell you the truth. You are in good company. Because I know, I look at my parenting and go, man, where did I even get that? Where did I, why, did I, why do I say stuff like that? Why do I act like that? I know in my mind I'm supposed to act one way, and then in the heat of the moment I act another way. But parents, small steps in the right direction. Just take small steps in the right direction, doing the right thing. And I want to tell you, I have to really run through this, but there are three stages your kids are going through and how you relate to them. It's in the book as well, but in case you missed the chapter, 
Let me just tell you about it. There's three phases. The first, the first stage is training. It's when they're a baby and, and the toddler years, and you can't put a number on it, but it's that first chunk. That's when you're establishing authority, really. You're establishing that voice of authority in their life. When, when, you, when they go the wrong way, when, they, when they're starting to look down the barrel of a knife, you say, stop, and they listen, right? Because you're establishing that. That happens in that first stage is training. The next stage, their whole middle section of their childhood is the coaching. It's when you begin to become uh, that arm around their shoulder, showing them the landscape, showing them around. That second stage is where you begin to show them life and you begin to give them a little bit of leeway. Let them fall down, let them scrape their knee and then come along as a coach and say, listen, this is how you could have done it differently. And then if you do both of those seasons right, the late teenage years, the later half of high school into their adulthood, and this is what we're all going for, you become a consultant. Or another way to say it is a friend. Isn't that what we all want from our kids? We want to be friends with them. I haven't met a parent that doesn't want to be a friend with their kid, even if they act tough. They want to be friendly. The problem is, is we we start that too early and we lose our voice of authority. We get all upset when they don't listen to us and then we have to go back to the training mode later in life. Oh, you're late on your curfew. Oh, you, you shouldn't have boys in your car. Oh, you shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. And we go to the, and there's always going to be opportunities where we need to do that. But if we focus too heavily on the friendship stuff early on, then we lose our opportunity to be lifelong friends with well-adjusted kids that we've raised because we've coached them and trained them in the first half. And let me just tell you, if you got that wrong, good company, all right? We all need to learn and grow on this. I've got a grown son. So I don't just have a six and seven-year-old. I have a 19-year-old, so I've been through this too. And let's let's actually talk about that because that's, that's pretty powerful too. I mean... When it comes to this verse, uh, I didn't put it on the screen for you. It's Proverbs 22. Train up a child in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. I would also add to that a little pastoral reference. They will not depart from it, but they will also not depart from you. Train up a child the way they should go, and they will always have that eye on you. They will, because that's God's design for family. God's design for family is that your voice is different than any other voice in the world. We have to steward that. We have to care for that. Train up a child in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. And that will also more than likely include you, unless they get called. You know, it's it's whatever. But let's talk specifically about probably the hardest season, teenage years. The teenage years. And we'll finish with this because it's like the toughest one for me personally. So I saved it for last. Um, Because if you've been there, if you've been there, boy, you know. And here's the last point I have for you. Identity is the key issue of the teenage years. Identity is the key issue of the teenage years. It's impossible to live pure and discover your purpose if you don't know who you are. I mean, let me just explain something to you. My my testimony of like going down the path of sex, drugs, and rock and roll started at a pretty young age. I was only in grade school. I was sixth and seventh grade when I started going in that, but I can pinpoint why it happened. I've told this story before. It's because I didn't know who I was. I didn't know how to identify with people. I felt insecure about my identity. And so when I partnered with the grunge kids, so back in my time, and now it's different, but in my time it was Kurt Cobain, Pearl Jam, Flannels, you know, and the the whole scene right there. When I did that and we were out in the back in the field smoking cigarettes as seventh graders, I felt like I belonged. Do you see what I'm saying? I felt like I had an identity and I had to find it from the world because I didn't find it in church like I should have. I didn't find it in Christ like I should have. That's why we want to do things differently for our kids. If you went down that road too, we want our kids to be secure in their identity. And if you have identity struggles going into your teenage years, and we all struggle with them, but if you don't know, it can be so harmful and so tough to deal with. And I don't care how good a job you did as a parent, kids are going to struggle with this because the world is screaming at them. Because I mean, think about it. When I was in school, and I had problems at school and someone was picking on me, whatever, I would come home and my problems were at school. But now, kids' problems follow them into their bedroom. The anxiety, the stress, the insecurity, the bullying follows them in the palm of their hand all the way to their bedroom. The stresses and pressures that kids are facing right now is more than any other generation has ever faced. More than mine. 
This is serious stuff. Parents, what I want to tell you is this. You have got to be available for your kids that are blooming, for your kids that are starting to grow up. It's way important than ever for you to be available for your kids, no matter what time of the night it is, no matter what's going on in their life, no matter what they're going through, no matter how in a, of an inconvenience it is, even if you have a big presentation tomorrow, even if you've got the pressures at work are mounting with you, you we, we have got to put those things to the side because our kids' lives are hanging in the balance of us just being available to them to have along the road conversations with them and explain to them, this is who you are. This is who God designed you to be. And we're parents. We, we have a higher calling. We've got to put ourselves to the side. This is tough for me because my son was two when I got saved, when I got sober and everything. He's 19 now. So I had to juggle the complications of being new in the Lord, learning how to, you know, live a Christ-centered life and, and raise a, a three and four-year-old from 100 miles away. My, I mean, it was very challenging. I didn't even know who I was, much less what I was supposed to do with my kid and so I had that long, we had to do that long distance thing where, because I was here, I got moved here and, and God set me here. And this is how I, I got saved and how I got sober and everything is because of this area and moving to this area. <laughs> Getting saved as a 23 year old and not having a lick of experience doing anything good in my entire life. And I've got this two, three year old boy and now he's a teenager. But I remember when he was 16, 17, those were some of the hardest times. Some of the hardest times. The most tears ever. The most pressure ever. When you're just imploring and pleading and, and then he had to go home. You know, I didn't even have him in my house. And I know a lot of people have to deal with that. That's a real thing. He's 19 now. And let me tell you one thing. If he wants to visit, I, and when I hear from him, it's like, hey, where are you been? Because he's, he's been working a job. He's doing good. He's doing really good. I'm so proud of him. When I was 19, forget about it. He's doing good. I'm happy, I'm happy for him. And when he calls, I don't care if I got the biggest conference of my life coming up. I don't care if I got a meeting with you or somebody else or whatever. If he calls, he's coming. If he says, Dad, I'm ready for a visit, let's go. Because I, I know that no one else in the whole world can give him what he needs as a father than me. Than me. My dad gave it to me. Bless him. Bless my dad. He's a, he's a good father. He wasn't the emotional type, you know. He wasn't the kind of, of dad that would give hugs and say he loves, you know, anybody. Because he's strong. He's a good dad, believe me. One of the best I've ever met. And I'm not just saying that because he's mine. He's a good father. So I learned I need to show him. I need to show Corbin. I need to show my son what it means to have a loving father. Because if he doesn't learn it from me, he's going to learn it from somewhere. He's going to learn something about fatherhood. And I want it to be right. I want to show him how much his father on earth loves him because I want him to know how much his father in heaven loves him. Parents, are you seeing? Are you seeing this? How critical this is? I joke about how hard it is to raise kids and sometimes I poke fun at my own, my own family dynamic and how hard it is, whatever. It's, but I would never joke about how serious it is to raise kids in the light of, of what the father's done for us and how important it is to bring them up. I would never joke about how important the season of life is when the kids are at home. Because if you want to enjoy them as adults, we have to put the hard work in early on. And it's hard. It's hard work in teaching them their identity, in learning our own, in speaking into the hearts of my family in good times and bad. Lord, help us. Think about how our Father is towards us in heaven. He, he's just so gracious, so merciful, so loving, always waiting to hear from us. And whenever He does, He welcomes us. He always has time for us. Are you seeing this? 
And we are crazier, <laughs> messier, more insubordinate at times. Aren't we? In our sin, in our, in our mess, in our problems, in, our, in all of our issues. And whenever we come to him, there's no condemnation. There's no belittling. There's no put downs. That's, that's an earthly relationship that needs to grow. But our heavenly father never treats us that way. Never treats us that way. Always welcomes us with open arms. Whenever we want to talk to him, bam, there he is. Bringing us in. So what I want to do today is I want to pray over your family. I want to lift you up in prayer. I want to lift your family up in prayer. I want to cover your family, whatever dynamic it's in. I want to cover your family in prayer. And another thing we're about to do is if you are looking to get into the family of God, I'll give you an opportunity to do that as well. So it's a twofold prayer. It's for your family, but it's also for you to join God's family. So I'm just going to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Father, I pray over every person here and their families. Lord, any struggles that they're facing, any wayward children, any, any struggling relationship in, in marriage or uh, someone going through depression as a, as a child, Lord, I just pray over every aspect. I can't even name them all. But Lord, I pray that every family would be Christ-centered and therefore blessed and moving in your design. God, you are so good to us and you always give us a second chance and a third and a fourth. As long as we're drawing breath, there's always an opportunity for us to grow closer to you and for us to build our family on your truths. But Lord, I also pray for every person here who's maybe had a struggled relationship in the family and that has compromise their relationship with you, God. I just want to pray for every person here that maybe you used to be in the family, but you drifted, or you just straight up want to join God's family and say, I want, I want to be known as a son of God. I want to be known as, as in this family. Be forgiven of my sins. Make Christ my Lord and Savior and join this family. If that's you today, would you just lift your hand up and say, that's me. I want to join a family. If that's you, go ahead, be bold. Today's your day. Amen. Hallelujah. I see you and you and you. Hallelujah. That's so beautiful. So wonderful. Church, family, let's pray together. Let's, let's pray all together. Just say this right after me. Say, Father God, thank you so much for sending your son to die on a cross for my sin so that I could be in your family. Fill me with your spirit. And show me the life that I should live. In Jesus' name, amen.